The higher you fly, the deeper you fall. People know me as Master Shi Heng Yi. You know, they think I'm a wise guy all, all day long, which I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I have other sides as well. That's the kind of stuff I think so many people are interested in because everyone's like, they see a Shaolin master, the Shaolin Temple Europe, and they think, that's all you do, all day, but we go to, to the apartment you was at and you've got motorcycles. How did the motorcycle thing start? Welcome back to Inspire Change with the Mulligan Brothers. I am your host, Jordan Mulligan, and today is the first episode of the podcast. I sit down with Master Shahangi and have a real, genuine conversation where we get to talk backwards and forwards about meeting each other and our lives and some of the struggles that we're going through. And you get to hear Master Shahangi like you've never heard before. Today's episode is powered by Huel. Huel is the new sponsor of the channel and the podcast, and it's great to announce this on episode one to you guys, because I've used these guys for over two years. It's a nutritionally complete, affordable, time efficient, great source of protein. It's something that I use on a daily basis to save me time, and I'll talk more about them today and throughout the rest of the year. But if you wanna find out more, head to the link in the description to find out more about Huel. Today's episode where we sat down in a studio with Master Shahangi to do this is something new for me. So I want your guys' feedback. Drop comments down below, come over to social media, let me know what you thought to the conversation. Yes, it is different from our interviews. No, don't worry, our interviews are not going anywhere. Over 2024, you're gonna see 50% of our conversations are gonna be in a podcast style setting and 50% of them are gonna be our interviews because we still always need to do our documentaries over on the main channel. So if that sounds good to you, hit the notification bell, hit the subscribe. I hope you're getting ready for 2024. And I'm excited for you to start 2024 with a brand new look with Master Shahangi and the Mulligan Brothers. Let's dive into the episode. So this is episode one. I couldn't have had a, be a better guest on the show. And for anyone who doesn't know, this is Master Shahangi from the Shaolin Temple Europe. He's featured on the channel probably eight times at this point, probably close to eight times. And calculated over a billion views or across all social media platforms just through the Mulligan Brothers projects, people sharing the projects, all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, now we're here doing the first episode as well. So yeah, thank you for coming on. Well, well okay. Then I think I have to respect it's the first time that I have to properly, <laughs> that I have to properly <laughs> wear something. Good. But no worries. So, I mean, the the theme of, of the visit has been, um, I would say like a a look into your life, you know, we've with the documentary we've just shot, we've had this sort of this look into your personal life, who you are, um, the the motorcycles, you know, things that I think people wouldn't expect. And, you know, hopefully at this point the documentary might have come out. If not, uh, it will be coming out. But yeah, that's that's the kind of stuff I think so many people are interested in because everyone's like they see a Shaolin master, the Shaolin Temple Europe, and they think, that's all you do, all day. Uh, he must have nothing else going on. He must sit there reading books and, uh, you know, preaching philosophy. But we go to, to the apartment you was at and you've got motorcycles and you're building out. I mean, how did the motorcycle thing start? Um, like I said, my first pocket money I earned by riding bicycle. Yeah. Yeah, directly with the first money that I had that I also received, I just started tuning the bikes. So like besides all the martial art, I have some passion for everything in a way that has wheels. It's just that uh, by the time I was maybe 12 years old, there was no money for a motorcycle, for example. But of course, when I heard one, when I saw one, and actually the first bike that I ever like really saw, which was really strange to me, was a Ducati Monster. You know, and, and this specific bike is known for having a very, let's say, um, a very unique style of frame. Because it's like not a one piece, it's made out of different, uh, different weldings, like the frame is very specific. Mm. And so this was the bike that I remembered for many, many years. And I said to myself, one day, if I would uh, have the chance, I want to get such a Ducati Monster. Well, and that was when I was about 14 years old. And the dream or that wish that I, that I set that time came true in two, when I was 28 years old. Oh, wow. So 14 years later, I still remember what I said. 
and I never forgot about it. Yeah, so that also means for me, you know, it's not, I'm not running after, I'm not interested necessarily in things that newly come out. Mm. For me, I'm a very, yeah, sometimes I like to keep pictures, I like to keep videos, but not masses of it. I want to have one picture, I want to have one video, which is, which has depth. I look at that picture, I know, I, I know what it connects, Yeah, you know? And this is for me, you know? So when I see today's bike, for example, today's monster, there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of memories connected to that. It reminds me of all the times in the past when I was young. Yeah. You know, so this is something which is going on even be, uh, besides the fact of being seriously dedicated in the field of martial arts. But like in the last years when things have been published, it has always been around the name, let's say, me being like the headmaster of the Shaolin Temple Europe. Mm. And I just felt like, you know, it's, it's not the proper way of judging people solely on what you see on the surface of them. This has always been the issue about everything. You always judge somebody, even if he insults you, you just judge him by the words that he's saying. You don't know what type of day he had. You don't know what type of problems he carries inside of him. You don't know how his upbringing, his education is, his mental states are, his views on the world are. You know nothing of this. And I think I would like to, yeah, this is where I thought, okay, I'm going to take myself as the example, because people know me as Master Shi Yi. You know, they think I'm a wise guy all, all day long, which I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have other sides as well. I think that's one of the best things about this visit is, obviously last last time we came up, like I knew that, like I knew that you had so much more to you than just just the teachings and, be, and being the headmaster. But this time, like I got to see what that was. And, you know, we, we were having a look at your your personal life and some of the stuff you do in your personal in your downtime and for me that's so humanizing because people have put you on a pedestal people, you know it's on social media there's a lot of they're ca not just for yourself but there's even with celebrities there's a lot of worshiping celebrities and i think because yours is based around spirituality that kind of thing is present in places and the thing I really liked about today is when we got to the bike and, you know, you've put thousands of hours into that bike, you know, over, over the years. And you said like, it's for you, it's going to be hard to let that go or you're invested in that materialistically, which obviously is a teaching, you know, we've spoken about not to be invested in, in materialism, but for you to be able to articulate the, yeah, it happens to me too. Like I'm not, just because I understand it, I'm not always above it. I feel like it gives the lesson more depth to know, you know, you've experienced what I am going through. If I've invested in a watch or a car or whatever it is, you know, that you've done it in a similar kind of fashion as well. That's why you've got, I would say, a better insight for the, the knowledge, the wisdom. Yeah, and that's exactly the point. Yeah, knowing, knowing is not a problem. Everybody understands the concept of, yes, if you hold on to it, it's impossible because things are changing. Nothing lasts forever. We know these things. But it's different to experience them. And uh, just recently, like one of the quotes I, I really like because it, it hits the point is, you cannot give what you don't have. Right? So it's, it's really basic understanding. You can't give what you don't have. So in the first run, it's even for me, all these teachings that are derived, let's say, from the Buddha, I have to practice them. Mm. It's not that just because I'm speaking them out, meaning that I possess the ability of what this teaching is talking about. I have to practice it myself. But it has just become so unavoidable for me, in my world perspective, that everything, what is known as the Buddhist teachings, or for, yeah, that every human being is facing these things sooner or later. And the question is just uh, when you want to start doing something about it. 
merging again together with the fact that if you have a problem right now and keep postponing the solution or to find a solution for any type of problem, any type of issue, if you don't solve it right now today, if you don't start to solve it today, tomorrow you wake up, it's still there. Mm. Yeah, so, and this is also the way of why in one of the previous talks we had today, I said, I know what my next day projects, week projects are. It is what is disturbing me the most. Mm. It is where I have the biggest issues with at the moment. And because I don't want to take these issues as a burden on my shoulder into the future, that's why my daily practice, my daily development and emphasis is, how can I do it in order to get rid right now of this unpleasant feeling that I have? And because I'm also learning, 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 I am looking for teachers, I'm looking for wisdom, I'm looking for teachings that are exactly tackling this problem. It's crazy to hear you're on that journey. And I guess you're perpetually on that journey because, you know, you've spoken about reaching out to different masters and finding new masters in, in, in things you want to work on. And that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. But I felt that when I think of you, I don't think like you need to go in search for that. Like I'm looking for mentors in my space, in filmmaking and podcasting and, and, uh, and trying to get that knowledge. And I try and spread that to the audience a lot of the time. And I think again, is like, it's great to hear you saying that because so many people are like, well, what does he need to know? Like he's the, the wise guy. He knows everything, not wise guy <laughs> in that kind of way, but you, you know, you've got so much wisdom and they, they think that you don't need to learn anything else. You don't need to know anything else. And, um, it's good to hear that you're still trying to, to grow. I mean, that to you, I know that's obvious, but like, I think there is still this perception. It's why I'm excited to sit down like this, because I think there is that perception of, you you know you're on this pedestal and that's it and you you know everything and you don't need to grow or or move past that point. Um, is it frustrating to have that kind of that thought about you? I know we spoke about the idea of this perfect image of who you are, especially with the you know the very first stuff we shot was all based around you being the the headmaster. So then there was this perception that. There's nothing else going on in your life. Was that, was that frustrating for you? It was not frustrating, but I saw, let's say, I saw the dangers involved. Let's say, call it, mm. I, I call mm. it danger right now. Look, it's like this. If, if I am for so many years finding myself in the field of martial arts, I like to see myself, this is a martial art bubble. And if somebody for many years is focusing on his career, they are in the career bubble. And each human being, all of them, is in some kind of bubble. Mm. And in order to realize in the, the true value of these teachings, now people see, okay, this is Shi Heng Yi, so it's the Shi Heng Yi bubble. So and what I would like to do right now is let that bubble burst. And then they will see, okay, showing Yi somehow, the bubble has bursted, but it's greater than it was before. Mm -hmm. It's not less. And that thing that you've always said every single time we've been here, the teachings are still the same. No matter what, even if you became a pop star and was invested in nice cars and was wearing gold suits and whatever it was, the teachings that you taught was, are still the same. You know, the, the, the lessons that people took away were still the same. I think I, I, I really want to be able to portray that, especially in the project that we're working on together now. Like I want people to know that, the, the teachings and everything. It doesn't matter if, if something, ha even if, if you sadly, if you passed away, you know, that's, I mean, that, I think that's the, the thing you've spoken about the most is once, once you are gone, the, the message and the teachings, shouldn't the people who heard them and it, and it impacted them and changed, changed their lives, shouldn't just attach themselves to another teacher just because they are more popular or more famous. It should be based on the teachings themselves. Um, there's, there's something I, I really need to bring up because I wanted to share, I shared it with you, um, but I've not shared it with the audience before. And it was, and I'm, I'm curious how to, you haven't been invested in this, or maybe you have been invested in this, I don't know, but 
growing up for us, our biggest hero of all time was Dwayne Johnson, you know, and growing up in, uh, working in the motivational world and on social media and all that kind of stuff, he just became bigger and bigger for us. You know, we'd, we, as kids, we'd watch him wrestling. And then when, as we got older, we'd watch him delivering motivational speeches and in the movies and all this kind of stuff. So after our first project together, the craziest thing happened. He messaged us and says, hey, love the work. It was unbelievable. Can, can you let the Shaolin master know that I love this stuff? Um, and one day when I get a chance, I want to shake his hand, and I, you know, and I, how, <laughs> you know, when, when I message you that, I mean, what, what's your reaction and how do you, or do you get invested in Dwayne Johnson, you know, seeing your message and saying those kind of things about it, you know? So the first time I, I encountered uh, Mr. Dwayne Johnson was, I think also from a movie but I'm normally not watching too many movies. Mm. So that means when it comes to celebrities, my, my um, let's say, my characters from like movies, for example, this is like, like Bruce Lee, Jet Li, Jackie Chan, mm -hmm. you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme, yeah. Dolph Lundgren, yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger. That was like my time when I was watching all these movies. Okay? Yeah. And of course I, I see, okay, movies are, the movies are always new movies come out. There are always new celebrities. And I don't know if they're big, if they're small, mm. but I heard and I saw him oftentimes and he's like very, let's say, um, charismatic and you recognize him directly. So yeah, in a way I, I felt like, okay, cool. <laughs> okay, why not? So this was, let's say, my reaction. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's such a humble response as well. But I mean, for us, it was, it would have been this time of year, right? It was before Christmas, because I think he said he wished Merry Christmas as well. Um, but it, it's the same thing for us. I think growing up, we did, we weren't, I've never been invested in sort of movie stars or, or, um, or starstruck by anyone. But I mean, the, <laughs> Dwayne Johnson's kind of like, he's on another kind of level. It's funny you say Jackie Chan. We, that's how we got into this, into filmmaking. Yeah, Jackie Chan. So my mom, she would go to like the charity shops, like secondhand stores, and she would get VHS of Jackie Chan movies because the director on a VHS, when you got to the end of the, end of the tape or, or a DVD, you would get uh, extra cuts, you know, for the behind the scenes. And, um, and a lot of it was with Jackie's movies, he would always do behind the scenes of how he did the stunts. So you'd get to see the, so Jackie Chan does all his own stunts. I, I know you know that, but for the audience, Jackie Chan, if you've watched one of his movies from leaping off buildings um, to jumping between buses, whatever it what crazy was, he did the, he did his own stunts. And that just captured our imagination, didn't it? And like, again, he's another person. Like if I, I'm not usually starstruck, but I think if I met Jackie, that would be quite a, It'd be a nice experience to to meet Jackie Chan, but um, so I mean, so you would you watch Jackie Chan movies, and was you inspired by like people like you know Bruce Lee, Jet Li, those kind of characters as well? I like to see skills in people mm. because that just reminds me again, okay, what I cannot do, and like I said, martial art always been my passion in a way. So I see the way how they move the body and also what they're capable. So even the stunts, I mean, mm. you know, <clears throat> like the body mechanics itself, even like if you have like two, two bars to, to just jump right away that yeah. you, you, you're no matter what it is. So what they all have as a martial artist normally is very, very well awareness and control about the body. Mm. So, also that means if they see something or if I see something, I need to know, I need to be sure that the command I'm giving to my body is one and one what my mind is creating there. Uh, it's like, okay, I see the bars, I want to jump with my legs right through it, but in order to jump right through it, the legs, they need to be straight. So I cannot afford that I start jumping, start running, and then suddenly one of the legs like remains angled like, mm -hmm. like this. You know? So I need to have a really proper, reliable body which is listening to me. Okay? And that is simply the expression why sometimes 
in the martial arts you say body and mind in harmony. Yeah, so what is that supposed to mean, body and mind in harmony? For me it means mind gives command, body listens. Okay? And this is where now maybe for some people it becomes philosophical. No, but for me it is like there are practical training ways. For me it was the martial arts. If I give command to my body, there is no coincidence happening with my body. I want to move one millimeter, I move one millimeter. I want to move one centimeter, I move one centimeter. And this is for me just special. Why? Because growing up, I realized that also there are simply so many things in this world that are not in your control. You know, I, I can't control what my mother tells me and I can't control what my brother tells me. Mm. If there is one thing where it's possible to really get a proper hold of, then I really think it must be you. It must be your body. That's it. Nothing else, not the dog, not the cat, no, no matter how much you teach them, but it's not your body. So for me, it is simply strange or not acceptable if you own a body which in a way, uh, as long as you're healthy, yeah? not, not talking now about people that unfortunately have a sickness maybe yeah. where, where the connections um, don't allow this. But I mean in general, if you have a healthy mind and you, if you have a healthy body, I think it is a proper way of really investing in the type of training to make your body yours. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And that also meaning, at, yeah, and at the same time, while doing so, while building up the connection and treating your body like it is yours, automatically all the stuff that is destroying the mind, that is like causing the depression and the frustration and all of these things automatically start to fall away. Why? Because you are stopping automatically to keep intoxicating your body. Because it's your body. But if you are like numb, numb and the awareness constantly spread wherever, and do not realize the value of what you have, then, then the cycle continues. The cycle, the, the spiral downwards continues. So at the end, from the movies, from seeing this, yeah, I mean, this was now a little bit deeper going into from the movies, but maybe that is the depth which also kept me. Today, I can talk about it like this. Yeah. As a child, I just saw, okay, cool moves. Okay, I want to do this too. And that's where I think it stems from, though. I, I really do think that being excited to go play as a kid is, is one of the, the biggest foundations of it. Because when you talk about the spiral of depression, if somebody's in that zone and they, and they come to me and ask him for help, the first thing I tell them is to try and take one step. That's it. If they can just get out of bed and take one step. They don't need to go run a marathon. They don't need to go run a 10K, whatever it is. They just need to take one step, one step in the right direction. And I think curiosity to go play and have fun is such an amazing driving force for that, that we lose as adults. And, and it's uh, uh, that's what I was gonna ask you is, what do you think the biggest success is to, to treating the, the human body in the right way? Because outside of martial arts like is it that you need to fight find it enjoyable is it that you need to uh, be invested in it somehow or be inspired as a child like was is is there something that you can see as a key ingredient whether it's martial arts basketball running walking just staying fit and active is there something you can see the successful people in terms of just staying healthy have as like a commonality to be perfectly honest i don't know I can just see what, what increased my willingness mm. to continuously go along this path. I would say went hand in hand with the fact of I started to appreciate life more. Okay, Appreciating the fact that despite all the disturbances and problems that you might face in this lifetime, we all have them, but 
we have the possibility to even have all of that stuff coming towards us. So what I'm saying is, because we're like existing, you see? Mm. So there are, there are maybe beings even, they never had the chance to get a life. You know, this is what I'm talking about right mm -hmm. now. You know, we complain about, I don't get a, I don't get the Xbox. I only get a PS5 whatsoever. Yeah, you know, today I don't get my pasta. I have to eat pizza. You know, this is a problem that we have. And on the other side, people ex or beings have not even taken form mm -hmm. in order to generate this type of problems. Okay, so where this is where I started with the appreciation of what I have, mm -hmm. making it also tolerant for myself, saying maybe the price in order to be able to experience this. Maybe this is the up and downs for you to figure out the way. But at the end of the day, it's still existence. You're still alive. That is the, the, the baseline for me. Mm. You know? And this started making me just walking through this lifetime just quite differently. I love that. The idea that we are gifted with existence and that there is a price of that, you know, it's not going to be easy at all times. Um, I, you know, the first time we spoke, you, you spoke about a lot, you spoke a lot about the, the universe in a, in a really uh, scientific way. I think you, you, you went to quite, to quite long, like uh, in depth in it. Uh, is, is that based in that anything like, have you, have you studied that before or? I return back to the bikes. You know, bikes is really materialistic. It's something about elements, so meaning what type of material. So I knew already like a frame made out of carbon fiber or a frame made out of aluminum is different than a steel frame. Mm. So this is why I also discovered in, in school time, my favorite lessons were one of them was English, second one was chemistry, third one was physics, and fourth one was mathematics. Mm. Okay, so everything very number, rational, cause and effect based. So this is why my interest also was into uh, like atoms, protons, neutrons, and, and all of these things. Yeah, this is where it actually comes from. So where I always beyond or besides the philosophical teachings that I received during my martial art training, of course, I always had in the mind, yeah, but we still have like the scientific way of trying to explain everything that's going on in the world. But that's exactly also how it is. Scientists discover what is there. If it would not be there, you, can't ex you, you cannot prove it. Mm. So that means also for me, the basis of everything is not science for me. Science is just getting deeper and deeper and, and have more proper ways in proving something. But what they prove is just something that has been there all the time already. Okay. So my question is, how come there is something all the time there already? This is what my emphasis is. And so therefore, I don't have this fight, for example, who is right, the religions or, 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 the, or the, the source about the universe or like the scientists. No, scientists have always, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but the worldview about whether we are round, whether we are flat, whatever. It has changed several times in history. So that means scientists have not always been right. Mm -hmm. Maybe nowadays they become more and more accurate. I don't know. Okay, but scientists also sometimes can measure wrong or can come to wrong conclusions. I don't know. But the fundamental basis is if there's something that you can observe, that you can discover, who put it there for you to discover it? What put it there for you to measure it? Have you got a belief on that? <laughs> I make it simple for I make it simple for the world. All the time I talk about connection, because if we strip off our clothes, we're getting closer of being similar because there's just skin covering our skeleton. You see, if we take the color out of our skin whatsoever, at the end, there's something the same about us. And that means 
that in my view, in my perspective, there is one source we're coming from. There's one source. And I don't know, and I don't want to give a name to this, because I don't know. But it is like my, my deep... Um, I'm trusting this, that we have the same source, which also makes it at the same time, again, more easily to actually understand why is it in the Buddhist teachings that compassion has such a high value? Because it is the logical consequence, let's say, if there really is the connection, compassion is the natural consequence of it. Mm. Because if we are connected and you are suffering, it is my suffering. And because suffering nobody wants, there is no other way than if I feel your suffering, that even that I try to put everything I have in power into place in order to also lower your suffering. Because either we succeed together or nobody will succeed. Very simple like this. For me, na naturally, if, if I do something bad to somebody, I feel bad. If I do something good for somebody, I feel good. But there has to be some kind of human nature to that. Like there has to be, in, in my opinion, I, I think we're born with the, mo the, the motivation to do good because it feels, it feels good. I, and I don't think I've ever done anything that has harmed somebody or bothered somebody, even in the slightest, it didn't somehow have a reverse impact on me and I felt negative about it. It, do you think? Do you think it could be human human nature to be? I mean, if you, I mean, you're saying com, it's human nature to be compassionate. Um, so yeah, is it? Do you think it's human nature to be good? If that's the case, why is there so much bad in the world as well? Like you know, we've been speaking about this year. It's not been the greatest for for humanity. I can't speak for humanity to be honest. But if you take, for example, this teaching literally that the world is a reflection of what you carry inside of you. I don't necessarily pay, place too much attention on, on the outside. I can feel, I know this is my body and I can feel internally what's going on with me. And, I, and if I have a clear mind, I can clearly distinguish if something is pleasant or if something is unpleasant. And if somebody likes to use rational or logical thinking, I can also see based on cause and effect, if I'm using harsh words, another consequence is going to arise in comparison of using, for example, understanding words. Okay, harsh action, rightful action. So. I can see the I can see it inside myself. Okay, so I don't need to watch out into the world in order to sense inside what would be my preferred state of being. It certainly is not unpleasant. Okay? And they are also like pleasant unpleasant. Now, now you would also say yes, but it is also like the same the same the, the, the two opposites of, of one metal, you would say, pleasant, unpleasant, good, bad, yeah, it, it belongs to the same category. So how can you say if this world consists of the both that you would choose pleasant, okay? It's not pleasant. It's not necessarily pleasant. It's equanimous. It's peace. That is the state. It's not pleasant, it's not unpleasant, it's peace. Mm. Yeah, it's the same way why I am not really this friend of propagating that this lifetime is about happiness. No, if you have happiness, I think you also have unhappiness. Mm. If you have the one, you have the other. But it's actually peace is, let's say, if I would have to choose a word, I think peace is properly expressing what it is. It's no movement. Mm. So it's like, the calm surface of the water, it's just there. It's just there. As soon as I tip it, with my finger on it, you have the happiness and you have the unhappiness. You have the wave starting mm -hmm. to come. If you don't want to have the fluctuation of life, there's only one state, the peaceful one, 
which means stop touching the water. Peaceful. Okay, and and this is more or less like uh, how I see it, how I observe it in my own life. Like I told you before, um, I too much enjoyed my last trip when I went to Montenegro. Mm. It was a super great time. I can still feel it. Yeah, but because of because of the because I tipped the water. Once I returned back to Germany, I really had to. I'm still on on the transition. Yeah, I really have to digest. I need to know what happened in Montenegro. It sounded like it was a a really good time. Did Shen, did the uh, Shen Shaokong with you? Shen was also awesome. Yeah, you had a good time. Well, what happens in Montenegro <laughs> stays in Vegas. <laughs> Oh, they got, uh, my head's running wild with what would have happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm the same, I think, but I, I experience it at much, much uh, intense polos. And that's what I'm trying to close them down. So, like, I have those highs, 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 and then the lows come in. Like, I, and I remember that actually the first time we spoke, you, you said don't invest in the highs, don't, don't invest in it. If you don't invest in the highs, you won't be as invested in the lows. You'll kind of start to settle in the middle. And that, that helped me massively trying to close, close that gap. And, and it's, it's tough when something amazing happens to not get too invested in the, the excitement, the fun, the thrill of some famous person saying something really nice to you or whatever it is. But the opposite does always come. Like I've never not experienced, and I, it's funny I say that now. And like my, my biggest goal is to win a BAFTA for for film. And the issue with that is I'm really invested in the high of that. There'll be a low on the other side. I'm sure when I win it, I'll be depressed and unhappy for a long, long period of time. If I can, if I can't detach myself from the gold medal that I want, this trophy that I want. Um, but yeah, trying to, I am trying to close the gap still. It's difficult though. Yeah, and maybe to, to, to conclude this a little bit, you know, everything, ever since we started also sharing the things out, I'm not telling anyone how to live his life. If you, if you, con if you watch everything that I'm sharing, the only thing I'm saying all the time is, watch the consequence. Mm. I'm not saying, I'm not propagating, don't run after money. I didn't say that. I also didn't say, don't become materialistic. I didn't say that. I also didn't say, don't have a relationship. I'm just saying, the higher you fly, the deeper you fall. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, if you want to fly high, do it. But if you fly high without somebody telling you, before you're starting the flight, that there will also come the descent, then I think it's kind of blind, mm. okay? Then I think it can hit you too hard sometimes without knowing it's going to come. So in a way, just to keep it in mind that there is something in, in, in our lifetime which is always balancing out. Yeah. It's not because somebody wants it. No, it's just like this. It is the laws of the nature. It's the laws of the universe. It is, however you call it, the balance of yin and yang. It is just there. It's not necessary to argue about it. It's there. And I think whatever you do, just take this into consideration that also you are going to deal with this. And so just prepare yourself. And this is all I'm saying. It's been big for me to almost have your voice at times in my head. Like, remember, like, there's another, there's a flip side to this. And I, I think I've always seen people getting a lot out of your teachings on our social pages have been the ones who are using it for awareness. They're using it to, to have some kind of awareness. Um, and again, it's quite funny, actually, because it's ex that exact thing of investing too hard into something, whether it's a BAFTA, a Lamborghini or whatever it is, it's some of the people I've seen struggle with the teachings are the ones who invested way too hard. And they took everything as 
this is concrete and this is exactly what I need to do and this is what he means and I'm going to live exactly like him and do this, this, this and this. And like we we spoke about, it, it was it's some of those people who have struggled on the other side to realize that but you like to fix motorcycles as well. Or, you know, you like to have a normal life as well. And, you know, all, the, all these kind of things, like, they're the kind of people I've seen struggle at times with it. And I, I guess it goes the same for the teachings, but um, it was really nice, again, to hear about ambition and the, you can still be ambitious. You can still, and again, just be careful on the other side, like just be aware and be careful. I think it's for some people, to hear you've got ambition is a bit of a, a a shock in some ways, but you wouldn't have been able to do everything that you've done if you didn't have some kind of plan or vision or purpose, I guess, without, yeah, it, it had to exist, surely. I mean, this is like the fire, I think we talk, well, or we're going to mm. talk, or we talked about in our conversation. That is actually really the, the motivating fact, the fire itself, you know? In the very beginning, it's not even, I mean, when you're young, it's not necessary. You think about the sense of life. So I started also growing up, growing up into this field of thoughts. So you know, after, you know, there's also, first, sometimes you need to have the things that you're striving to. Yeah? So it can be you're following up on the agendas in order to be successful, in order to have money, in order to have an expensive watch, an expensive car, whatever. And I really think that partially if you are disciplined, if you do the proper things, if you stay determined, stop the laziness, chances are very high that many of the goals that you're setting to yourself will become true. Okay, so. But after you reach the goals, now it's getting interesting. Now, actually, for me, the observation started. Now you have it, five years of your lifetime invested. Now you have it, five years of like going, okay? And now what happens inside of you in relationship to what was so important to you? You know, it's not that you have five years now of satisfaction. It's not five years of pleasantness. It sometimes is not even five minutes of joy depending on what it is. So what I see there is a huge investment of lifetime on the one side for the price of what? Having five minutes, 50 minutes of satisfaction mm. and then happening what? Happening the next goal. Yeah. I, I, I've always seen it like this as well, that I think a nice watch, a big house, a nice car, a million pounds, whatever it is, can be enough motivation to give you the success that you want. It can, things can be motivation enough. I, I just think that they're not deep enough. That one, it will be, it'd be easier if you had a, a, a more, something with more purpose, in my opinion, to get you there. I think you'd find the road easier because in my opinion, there's a bigger payoff. But again, the thing could still get you there. But I also think that once you arrive, that's where you arrive in problems when it's a thing. You know, like you say, when you've paid five years of your life for a thing, that's, I think, where you arrive at a difficult place. And the down is, is, is really down. If, you, if I arrived at... Uh, uh, it, my goal is still materialistic, I would say, at BAFTA, but that, that goal is based in I have to be a certain skill level as a filmmaker to arrive there. When I arrive there, there probably will be some depression around the fact that this didn't actually give me anything. But trying to reach the heights of that made me a great filmmaker. I guess you could say the same for, for material things, though. You would, to achieve a million pounds or a Lamborghini or something like that, you'd have to have been some kind of successful, you would have learned some lessons along the way for sure. So maybe, I mean, maybe materialistic things are still useful, I guess, in, in, some, in some aspects. It just came up right now uh, about this question. So why is like this ambition maybe sometimes necessary? You know, in, the, in, the, in Buddha's teachings, 
it starts with the sentence, with our thoughts, we create the world. All right, with our thoughts, we create the world. So no matter how you're interpreting this now, but that means there is something powerful about you. There's something powerful about each one of us. And maybe this is the reason why it makes sense. I don't know who made these games, yeah? But why it makes sense that sometimes it's natural that we humans put ourselves some goals. Maybe some easy one first, but the goal is in your mind. Now you do start the work and then you even reach that goal. So what does it mean? It means that what you sought before now started to materialize. If you do more of these things and the goals become higher and higher and, you're, uh, yeah, and what you're putting onto your mind also becomes like at the moment unreachable, but then you really reach it one day. It's also again an expression therefore, where did it start? Here, where are you right now? There. Mm. So maybe this is the way to display to the human mind, to the human being, how powerful it is, all right? And so there are many things that you can create once this one is correct. I hope you're enjoying this episode with Master Shihang Yi. Today's episode was sponsored by our new sponsor, Huel. Every episode is going to be powered by Huel. And uh, this is a product I've genuinely used for the last two years. And the reason I'm making up a shake right now is because it is lunchtime. But also, when we were on set filming these projects and was out in the Shaolin Temple Europe, was driving across Germany with our whole film crew, Huel is what saved us. It saved us a ton of time. And that's one of the biggest reasons I use it because it's nutritionally complete. It's a great source of protein. It's affordable, but it's time effective. It's why I use it so much. We have all our camera gear. We're doing interviews. We're also trying to break world record stone lifts and stay in shape and keep our abs <laughs> and you know all that kind of good stuff, which is very difficult when you're a busy person. So for me, when I can reach into my bag, I know that I've got a meal that's nutritionally complete, has all the calories that I need. It has the protein source that I need. It's plant-based. It's a game changer. It's so convenient that it's like a hack to life for me. So if you guys want to find out more, head to the link in the description. We can find out more about Huel and their whole product range that goes from bars and snacks to full meals to the amazing shakes that I use all the time. Thank you to Huel for sponsoring the podcast and powering our whole film crew. Let's dive back into the episode with Master Shi Hong Yi. I mean, we spoke about manifestation yesterday, and it's something, it's something I am a huge believer in. And I think my my brothers and sisters are as well. So we we used to, before the YouTube channel was successful, um, we would be in my mum's, she had this little crawl space at the top of her house. It's like you couldn't stand up in it, it's probably about five foot high. And it was in the in the attic space and we would sit in there and we had a computer set up and we'd be editing away. And we really truly believed that we were ha we would have a big 10,000 square foot film studio, like wholeheartedly. It wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't like we were putting it out there because we were trying to manifest it or anything like that. We just believed it for some reason, whatever it was, we just thought it was part of the plan of our mission to, to help inspire change through film. And as, as time went on, we would start to really talk about what that space looked like to the point where I think for me, this is how I would, this is why I spoke about, um, what was it yesterday? The not manifestation, there was another word for it. Law of attraction. So I didn't know about law of attraction, but I, I learned this afterwards. But for me, I would use the law of attraction um, to the point where I could, feel like I'd already been to the place that I was trying to create. So then when we, when we eventually arrived at the studio and we, we, we purchased a studio, it felt so normal. There was no celebration. There was no investment in the high because it, for five years, we'd spoke about this place and exactly what it looked like. And when we got there, it was exactly how we'd spoke about it. And we believed it so much that it just was. Um, and I, I know we, we spoke about it yesterday, but like, is that because the I believed it so much that 
like, what, is there a reasoning behind the idea of once you can truly, truly believe in something, you can then achieve it or bring it into reality? Well, I think that if it's not on your mind, you will not recognize it when it comes. Mm. Okay, so so this is just like if it's, if you cannot like imagine something happening on the mind, see it somehow, have the possibility, the open mindedness that something, whatever it is, you don't have to precisely see exactly. Yeah, but if the if there is no space available in the mind in order to let something come when it comes, you don't know necessarily when it comes, but then it can't come. Mm. Okay, so the fundamental basis is open-mindedness. Mm. Okay, and now talking about being so detailed about future visions, the way how I see the things is, of course I have my vision and I have my, my, my plans, how something is supposed to look. But at the same time, I also see it for myself that actually it's just a guideline. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a rough guideline. But it's never detailed. Why? Because in everything that I have done until now, in, in the field of martial arts, in building up the bikes, in cr creating the temple, in organizing everything, I would have been 100% wrong always if I would have done it too detailed. Mm -hmm. Because there are just some things which is in this, in this lifetime that are based on the fact of things are uncertain. Yeah. And this is the great part about it. Like just imagine, just like you said, I imagine it to be exactly like this and then it just manifests. Mm. If you saw it before exactly like this already, wh why would you even need to manifest it anymore? Yeah. Kind of true. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. Also, like if you can very clearly say, okay, Jordan, where are we going to be? Like in 2025, January 2025, 10 o'clock. If you could give me a precise answer right now, why, why would we need to go there anymore? Mm, yeah. All right. So that means this fact of the future is unknown. We don't know what it's going to bring. Well, this is the good message. I agree. I agree. It's, I mean, that's what ha that is what happened for that particular thing. But in terms of the journey of what we've been on, yeah, I wouldn't expect we're here today at all. You, when we were in the in my mum's attic, that's this is not something that I thought of doing. Like I didn't think that I'd be filming these kind of projects. Um, I am curious though. What's your what is your guideline now for the future? Like, what's your your vision? You know, for the Shaolin Temple for yourself. Like, what does it look like for the next? I don't know, however many years. I started taking myself a little bit out in general. Mm. I'm waiting. Okay. I'm absolutely waiting. I have in this sense, no, because we are connected. It's not only up to my decision. Okay. My disciples, the volunteers, the people that I have delegated now, the, the power two, for example, they also have a huge influence on how things are going to develop. And for me, I just realized this was a very, very, very special year for me, this 40 years. And before I made plans, I was structured. What I want, I got. Now maybe I just feel like, okay, how is it to live a life and get and take the wanting out? Take the wanting out. No more running. The base is set. No, no more running. What comes, comes, and then I see how I deal with it. This is what, uh, the only thing I can really say, I have no vision. Wow. In, in, in that sense. No. Yeah, wow. No, I get it, I get it. No, I, I mean, for, for myself, I mean, there's a, there's a pressure that comes along with setting those plans. There is a, well, I, I mean, it's self-imposed, but like for me, like I would, I guess it would be good somewhat to try and let go at times, but there is a pressure to succeed. I think our, our happiness is based on whether we're on the plot, on the on the plan, and we're we're moving forward with the goals and the vision that we've got set, or or unhappiness is based on if we're not on the plan and we're you know further away. So I, I can see the the thinking behind it for sure. 
Um, I, I know for a fact, if I didn't go into conversation about the Shaolin methods and uh, legends of Shaolin monks, I'd get slated in the comments. So I do want to ask, like, you know, like stuff like bone hardening and um, I remember as a kid, I'd watch some of the Shaolin teachings and they could, they could resonate, they could create a frequency with their voice that they could smash glasses and vases and all that, you know, those kind of things. Where's the line of truth and myth on, on that kind of stuff? Like what kind of things have you seen and witnessed with your own eyes that would blow people away? And where's the thing where people are just, it's all for TV, it's not real? I haven't seen everything that's existing in this world, in this existence. I have, I have no proof for all of these things not to exist. Okay. But there are certain things when it comes to the strength of what your body can achieve. Also, like we met also like Shifu Yanlei, you know, one of his special skills is the iron body. I mean, if you don't touch it, if you don't kick him, if you're not physically there and you maybe just watch in the, on the screen or whatever, you would say, yeah, but it's just like he's tensing up his muscles and just takes the kick like this. It's different when you are standing in front of him and kick him mm. because then you know why it's called iron body. I, I've witnessed him with a, the heaviest iron bar and he's absolutely pounded his, his rib cage with it, which I'm sure would shatter most people's ribs. Then sometimes also no touch things. This is, this is like maybe an area, especially in the field of martial arts, meaning people being moved without seeing that there is a physical touch. Okay. So people assume, let's say in a way, well, either it is fake or it is whatever. It depends on how sensitive a person is and definitely you can sense if somebody has that skill set that already from that distance, there can be something which is very, very electrifying or something which is very magnetic. So there are people out there that can express very much and let's say an energy, an aura around them, which is pushing you away from them. At the same time, people can have an aura, magnetic, let's say magnetic, which is somehow drawing all the time, drawing you towards them. It is like sometimes you, you just walk on the street, one person walks straight, but another person con continuously always is being drawn in just by walking mm. straight. You know, such things. The question is if you are, if you are sensitive. Is it that you can see that some people are susceptible to like two different types of people would work better? Somebody who has some kind of like pushing energy, somebody who is susceptible to be pushed away. Is, is, have you seen like, do, do people, when they're doing these demonstrations, look for people who are more susceptible to, to their, their pushing or? Let me put it like this. The real ones that I saw, they are mainly located in the world of healing. Okay, so that means somebody just really lays down and with no touch, there's, there's no touching there. But you still see just by going over certain areas of the body, there's still like shows and reaction. And this definitely is, is happening. So I don't know what it is that is being transmitted. Maybe you would easily say it's chi, okay. But there is some cause and effect. There's some direct relation to this. So this is what I witness, what I can see. So, but also now that we already talked about this, especially sometimes I even posted last year with, uh, with Grandmaster Zhang Yushan, he just showed me some other principles, some other methods that are existing. Yeah, meaning I just like start to push him and you, you don't really see that there is a big movement from his side, but I am like flying like a few meters off. Okay. So when you watch it on the screen, uh, it just looks, it, it, it doesn't fit to the mind. There is no movement visible, but how come the reaction is so huge? 
you understand? So in order for something big to happen, maybe something big in the beginning also needs to be the cause. But what the people don't see is actually that, um, how I say this? Through the screen, you cannot see how much pressure I apply on, the, on somebody's body. Mm -hmm. Okay? And especially when somebody is training, for example, in the field of martial arts, it goes hand in hand that your body actually becomes more adaptable. The bandwidth of your body being soft and also having the ability of being hard. This is actually what is increasing. The soft becomes more soft throughout the practice. The hard becomes more hard throughout the practice. So that means the bandwidth of what your body is able to cope with, it becomes bigger and bigger. So that means you are almost like a foam, like SpongeBob. Yeah, so that means you can squeeze SpongeBob really, really small. And when you take the hands off, then boom. So there is something about elasticity. I've seen the, the videos that you're talking about. And the, the reason that I have, when we came the second time, I can't remember, we did some kind of thing. And it, I, I, a lot of the force comes from yourself as well. Like, but they managed to push it back into you. So it's kind of like, I, 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 with the, without being there to feel it and see what is happening on, on the, on video, on screen or whatever, you can't really get a, a feel for what that, what it feels like to have all the force you're putting into somebody return back to you and some more. Um, it does feel completely different. I, I think, but there is that there's, because there is a, I guess there are people online who do fake it. I know you wouldn't call people out or, or you know, or, you know, or be able to provide any evidence. You neither would I, to be fair, to provide any evidence, but. Look, no, just grab, just like you, hold the hand. Look, like this, I'm telling you right now. Yeah. This arm is empty. Okay, you sense how it is. Yeah. Now it's different. It's, ch it, yeah, it felt like a completely different transition, yeah. Yeah, now it's, yeah, it's gone. Now yeah. it's dead. Yeah. The more far now the cameras are off, you know, they see nothing. I don't move my arm, I do nothing. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it feels quite surreal, yeah. But no one will get that. No, no one will get the, the difference of that. Uh, it's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like, this is a terrible example of what it's like, but it's like boiled spaghetti turning into hard spaghetti. In, like, that's the best way I could say it. But yeah, you can't you can't gauge that on camera, I guess. Yeah, but and but you do get people who, or maybe you don't get people who fake it. I don't know. I, I guess I don't know. But there's a lot of, ju of judgment on the space in general, especially in, in martial arts, because people are so. Um, critical of it, you know, it's, 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 it gets a lot of, especially on social media, a lot of criticism. And um, I think people go, well, look at the UFC, like they can't, they wouldn't do that. And it, it's a completely different type of training. I don't think it's appreciated in that way, but yeah. I mean, you know, when you look at other martial arts and other, other sports, what's it like for you to look at someone like a Mike Tyson, uh, like, are you inspired by those guys? Like, and in the UFC, I mean, is, are there any names that come to mind? Like when you were growing up that you were like, you know, you looked towards as inspiration in, in different combat sports? So certainly I can name them. Mike Tyson, Mike certainly, Tyson. 100%. Yeah. Burkow. Yes. Also like, uh, even maybe, I don't know him personally, but how was his name? Ah. Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor. Wish Regard, regardless of the way yeah. how he like displaced himself, yeah. but the skill level, sorry, is unbeaten in a way. Yeah. So you know you don't reach this type of hates if you are if you're lazy. Yeah, I, I, Conor McGregor. He he's a huge inspiration to us. When when we started Mulligan Brothers, he was one of the first people who recognized us and and you know messaged back some of the videos we created, but. The reason I liked him so much is because he was from humble beginnings. He was just so disciplined in his training. He put everything back into his training and was just invested in all martial arts, all forms of combat and learned from all those forms. And you can tell in his style, like he's completely different from everybody else. 
And then you add the fact that he can talk in the way that he talks and get people um, inspired in the way that he does. I, so when, when you watch Conor McGregor, what, what do you take from that in terms of inspiration? I mean, for example, I really just like imagine myself, okay, standing against someone like him. Yeah, what would I do? And, and this is like giving me also hints for myself. Where are my weaknesses? Where are the strengths probably? And then watching him, of course, seeing how is he training? So what is the regimen that made him become like having this type of body and having this type of skill set? So if I see him doing any type of fight and I see some of the moves where I see, okay, that was a good one, then I just ask myself, okay, and what, what do you need? How, what do you need to prepare? Which type of techniques you need to learn? What type of training is it that allows you to do this type of technique? Okay, and that as a martial artist is just like sometimes giving me methods that maybe in the field of Kung Fu I have not seen before. Okay, same way like when, when Mike Tyson has his, uh, his specific style of fighting, all right, um, his training also looks different than average boxing training, let's say. Mm. Okay. And the special part, and, and this is where people will hate me for whatever, yeah? But what I appreciate about all of them, I don't know them personally, so that's why I'm not talking personally anything, but I see they are very unique in what they do. And what they also have in common is, now just for example, Andrew Tate. Yeah? It's not that I share all opinions that he's sharing. What I appreciate a lot is, he just goes his way. <laughs> okay? So apparently he has this type of confidence. He has... Yeah. There is something strong about him. Yeah, for sure. Okay? And, and this is what I appreciate. Everybody, there are so many different type of famous, let's say, or well-known people in the field of social media. And what I like about all of them is that they found a way in order to express, in, in order to express that if you do the right things, everyone can become very unique in something. Mm. But the ingredient in order to become unique and and setting the benchmark in a certain area is the same for everyone. It's the same like also now, yeah, we, we talked about uh, Dr. Jordan B. Patterson before. Yeah. His vocabulary, his rhetoric is like top notch. Yeah. Yeah, I had, th this is a, like in a way also like frightening for me. Yeah. It, it's like so high level. But this is where, where I just see definitely is like um, where I for myself say, okay, in this field, I can definitely learn a lot, for example, mm. from him. And this is how I see it. Yeah, on Jordan Peterson, he's somebody I wanted to interview for a while. Like I said, it's something we were trying to set up. And his vocabulary is something that scares me. <laughs> Holding my own with him would be, uh, would be difficult. But um, it's, it's funny, the conversation that we had yesterday was the, the opinions are so polarized that you're not allowed to say, you're not allowed to say, I, I, from Conor McGregor, I take that he's a master of his craft. You know, he's so invested in every single mixed martial arts that he will study it to the absolute detail to become the master of his craft. Um, Andrew Tate, like for me, the way in which he is invested in his brother and his, his, his relationship with his brothers, I, I genuinely think that's something to aspire to, the way they've got each other's backs. I, I do. Jordan Peterson, his intelligence, like all these things. We're talking about Elon Musk, Mike Tyson, like the, all these people, they have great qualities about them. You don't have to agree with everything, but I think it's so, it, it's, it, I, I've always said, everybody has some, something to teach you. Even if it was the biggest, they, they were the biggest, uh, I'm trying to say this nicely without swearing. Uh, I don't know if there's a word for it. They, um, the big, if they were the biggest fuck up ever, you know, if they were the biggest fuck up ever, there's still lessons there. 
even if it's in a, an alt lesson of what not to do, it's how we see things and how we decide to see them as lessons and where we can find the, the knowledge, the wisdom or the growth for us. For me, that's the most valuable thing to be able to understand that you can get that in everybody. And I also think it's really sad when you've got people like these fascinating people who are completely different, like Conor McGregor, and you're not allowed to take the great out of him because you don't agree with his political stance or what he said on something you don't agree with. I think it's really small minded personally to not be able to take the, the knowledge and wisdom out of those great people. And we could talk for ages. I mean, Elon Musk was someone we're speaking about yesterday. I mean, um, for me, he is, I see him as this incredible man of our generation who is, who may push civilization to other planets or maybe the start the start of somebody pushing the human race to other planets and to me that's amazing and if he did something bad or something you didn't agree with which he, he probably has I, 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 I most likely don't agree with everything that he's ever done I don't know but that thing I think is fascinating I think is unbelievable I think it's one of the best things for humanity personally I just think it's incredible and to not be able to take that away I, I just think this i think it's quite silly like i think it's ridiculous that we're in this state of affairs at the moment well i think this is like social media mm. okay so why i'm also happy like to being able to show you everything that we did this morning because people don't know me people have an image about Shi Yi. they don't know me so if somebody wants to judge something, then they can only judge by, by my actions. They can't judge the person because nobody has ever seen me. Very simple like this. And so if I look out and I, and I compliment someone, I compliment his actions. I compliment his achievements. I don't compliment the person behind. Why? Because I don't know them. And, and this is also like really the message. As long as you really do not know a person, you cannot insult a person. The saying that we spoke about yesterday, no one would, no one wants to be in Elon Musk's shoes. But then there's the saying, um, you don't want to walk a mile in my shoes. What is, what would that look like if someone walked a mile in your shoes? I really think if they watch the documentary, they will know. If you watch closely, you will yeah. know. I think this, this time round, Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I feel the the conversation we just had, the last conversation we had, and what we spoke about today, I think it's a different insight to to yourself that people. I I I, can, I agree with you. Like if they if they watch closely, they'll they would understand. Yeah. Um, and I think we are. Social media is one of those things as well that I think you pick and choose the things that you like about somebody or that they that they have or they own and you pick and choose like it's a buffet all the things you love about that person but you don't you don't invest in a thing the price they paid to get those things and what they had to sacrifice to get those things and you're not willing to take that on board either and that's where the whole picture is lost especially on social media because social media however we like to cut it up is designed to put a snapshot of your best life picture perfect life online and show off to whoever it is and maybe through no fault of our own but that's what the algorithm likes now and maybe it's human nature that's developed the algorithm but we're looking at the snapshots of the best parts of people's lives and then we also are there to slate people down when we look at the good side of their life but we're not focusing on the fact that they're probably, sometimes those people could be the saddest people on planet Earth and you're just selecting one tiny sliver of what they have and saying that you want that. And uh, again, it's one of those things where I think perspective, awareness, um, truly removing yourself from social media and even like the current, you know, the, the community of the world, you have to really zoom out because we're also so macro focused on those kind of things, especially with social media and having awareness and go, right, well, I know in my life 
the things that I post on Instagram is not the only thing that's going on. I've got all these thoughts and feelings in my head. I feel depressed sometimes. I feel sad sometimes. I argue with my brothers and sisters, whatever it is. But I don't share those things on social media. Um, and I, it does, it, it saddens me that some people get upset by the fact they see other people have things they want, but they, again, they're not thinking about the things that, that, that other people are going through or the fact that it's just a snapshot again. Is there, is there any teachings in Shaolin that talk about the idea of um, like false deities and, you know, like material goods and how it's not great for the mind? It's simply rooted, I would say, in the fact of attachment. Mm. Okay, so it's like why I'm not a friend of investing, for example, buying a house, buying an apartment. Why? Because as soon as there is a house standing somewhere, something about me is stuck. Okay, because we need to take care of it. Mm. Okay, so in in German word, it's called like immobilie. Yeah, if you, if you, yeah, but immobile. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. exactly what was happening, okay? Yeah. So this is when it comes to this type of teaching, meaning the more you attach to something, now it doesn't necessarily only have to be like material. It's in general, whatever is this, you get attached to it, you're stuck. But the world is turning, everything is changing. So I think if you want to get somehow in harmony, you can't be stuck. That this is for me the, the general understanding. So I make it simple for myself. I'm not talking about material. I'm not talking about just emotional, whatever it is. You can get stuck in material, get stuck in emotionally, and also can get stuck mentally, can get stuck with your ideas. But it all follows the same principle. You get stuck, something about you is bound there. The energy is bound. So, and if you want to move on, well, then the burden must go. This is what it is. But now just to jump back, uh, just one, one step before that, yeah. If somebody is willing to take the same sufferings as like other people, no matter what, you look at any successful person. I think once the circumstances would also be the same, the only question would be if you are also willing to go through the suffering and, uh, and the sacrifices somebody has went through. And that's all about it. So it's not just about what do you want. It's especially about what are you willing to sacrifice for this. And I make it very, very simple, for example. Yeah? For the last 23 years, 99% of the time, I wake up alone and I go to bed alone. And this is why nowadays I reach so many people. I think this is also something that goes hand in hand to it. Mm. Okay. And if somebody wants to have this life, well, chances are high. <laughs> this is the question. What type of sacrifices are you willing to, to go through? What type of suffering are you willing to take? And based on that, it determines what can you reach. On that point as well, I, this is something I want to, I'd love to try and articulate for the audience as well. Because I think you painted a picture there. Say if we were to take somebody like Dwayne Johnson, just for the, for the sake of this analogy, if you took Dwayne Johnson and you, and you put him where he is today with everything he owns today, and then you showed exactly what he had to do to get to those steps, and you in detail, and then you put somebody at the start line and says, "Are you willing to do what he did to get to where he ha where he's got to?" And some people would say yes, and they would try, and maybe if they would fail, maybe they'd succeed. Some people would say no, there's too much work, and they probably wouldn't do it. This is the this is the fact that gets me, and I, I love this. The difference is is Dwayne Johnson. He didn't get a picture of all the results and he didn't know that he was going to be this big success he had to do all the work anyway with no promise and this is where i think people get confused is people say stuff like well i would work out every day three times a day to be a professional footballer because that's what a professional footballer does and they're a professional footballer but they had to do years and years and years and years of work with no promise of being a professional footballer 
and still do the work and then hopefully achieve it. And I think that's that's the difference is people say they're willing to pay the price, but when you remove the promise of success, I think it's a completely different ball game. I think it's such a difficult journey into the unknown that people don't understand as much when they make these kinds of analogies. And like you did that for years and years and years. You didn't know you was gonna have this success with a Shaolin Temple when you were waking up every single day doing this. You just, I guess, hoped and had maybe had a vision and you made it, but you didn't know. Does it make, does the analogy make sense? That absolutely makes sense. I was just thinking maybe that something, all the type of extraordinary things happen without you planning them. Maybe this is really the price for you accepting the fact of going through suffering. This is like my philosophy. So you are willing to, to really keep going, stay disciplined, don't give up. Just have trust in whatever. And because you keep on going, because someone can see how much pain, how much suffering you're willing to take, maybe this is the reason why sometimes there are presents. Of course, you can take this only as a picture. But maybe this is the analogy, yeah? Mm. Well, I, I felt that that's the case. Like, the more... Of, it's such a, a terrible piece of advice or quote, but the more we have suffered and the harder it's been usually wherever it was at some point, the, m the more the gift was for us. Um, and it seems to always be the case. And I guess it's that thing again, the balance of the universe, like you put in and you put in and you put in and you put in and you give and give and give. And then one day somewhere unknown to you, it comes back. And it's, it feels like magic sometimes that the way it happens, but it does. And it usually happens in the, the, the place you weren't looking is where the gift will be returned. Maybe not where you wanted it, but something will come. And I've always found it fascinating, incredible. And I think when you understand that finally, it does change your life. And if you can just start to trust that, we say trust the process because we feel that we know now, we've had that feedback once. And once we, we had it once, it came two, three, four times. And every, the, the more and more that came, the more we understood that it will come somehow. As long as we just keep trusting the process and we stay disciplined, we put as much work as we can into it and bear the hard times with grit and determination. At some point, it will, there'll be something, whether it's a gift at the doorstep or whatever it is, but it will be returned. Um, I think it's hard for some people to have faith in that though, or believe that it will come back, especially when it's painful. Maybe just take a look at the nature. No, this is why. Why are sometimes the lifestyles that we have so much related to the nature, why I like to go to the nature, because there it gives sometimes the answers. You just look at, for example, there are some trees, they grow quite fast. And then you have some bamboos, like you know, so many years, nothing's happening. And suddenly the boost comes. So, but what all of them have in common is it's about the roots. So, and some roots take longer, some roots they need to prepare properly, knowing what's going to happen later on. So, and this rooting, meaning entering into new territory, is also what makes it so painful when we are, are trying to build up roots in our life. Also now coming back to like the martial training, there are exercises which are called strengthening the roots, developing the roots, rooting. So, and are these relaxing exercises? No. They are exhausting. Hard, <clears throat> hard for the mind. Challenging for your discipline exercises. But when you go through it, everything else you're going to build upon this is just going to benefit from it yeah and so how fast something goes or whatever is really not 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 important this is not where to place the attention on yeah i completely agree as well the uh the foundation you build is 
the 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 most important thing. I think that's the thing again of falling from great heights. I, I don't think that happens as much when you've put in a lot of time, a lot of effort. The uh, the, the the difficult bit I think for a lot of people is the moment when you most want to give up is usually the moment you're on the precipice of success or reaching close to that goal. Uh, it's quite, I guess, quite a bit of sweet. Same with with the bamboo analogy. I've heard that before. And then when it does come, it, it slowly, 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 but then suddenly, and it and it and it comes. And I, I feel it's the same way with success as well. You could be on the precipice. You're so close to it. And that's when that coming out of the concrete or cracking out of the floor for that bamboo shoot is the same for you of having that success. It's that last amount of resistance that's the hardest to break through, um, which I guess, again, is is difficult to tell people to stay the course and, and trust the process. Either you have the iron will, like I said before, or someone, something enters into your life that gives you that spark, that final spark. Mm. Maybe you alone... You can't push, you have pushed yourself, you can't anymore, but there are people that can help you with that. If it's meant to be, hopefully come, yeah. We, we spoke about fate yesterday. I, I, again, like, do, do you believe in fate? Like if it, if it was, if it was some, if it was meant to happen, it was good for the world, would somebody come in and, and get you through that last little bit? In the way how you just define it, yes. Just as you said right now, absolute yes. I love that. I, so this is this is something I, when we spoke in the last interview, you'd mentioned the word loneliness a few times. And I, I, I'm really interested to hear your definition and also your experience with it. Because I know for a fact, especially after COVID, it's been a huge, it's been like young men experiencing loneliness has been this huge um issue i would say in society i think even myself and my brothers have experienced it at times but when you say loneliness do you mean being alone or do you mean do you mean like feeling lonely like there was no one there for you does that make sense the, the distinction in the two so the loneliness i describe is not the way how i said it or mean it it's not that i was lacking people around me Okay, I'm constantly somehow involved in, in events, having training, all of these things. What makes it lonely is not even necessarily that I don't have a connection with other, let's say, soul brothers, soul sisters, where we know that there is a support. The loneliness is in regards to the path that you are walking. Yeah. Being, being inside with you guys, for example, for the last two, three days, beyond the fact of that we are physically close, but I think I feel there is even another connection, another layer beyond that. That layer of, okay, you could also be like a brother. A brother with another job, with another vision, mm. okay? So, of course, there is also this type of connection. But the loneliness, I say, is, yeah, but... Sometimes you're also gone, you're going to be go back to UK once we meet the connection is back. But then there is still that loneliness of it's your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's the questioning of what to do next, this type of loneliness. Okay. And the more you want to move on, the more you spend time being lonely. Mm. This is like the type of loneliness like I'm also referring to. I'm lucky I've got my brothers and sisters because we feel like we're on the same purpose, the same path. And I've never felt lonely on that journey. And then I'd say recently I've had people come into my life that have been like brothers and sisters to me as well on the path of, uh, of doing that. So was it that you found people in those, on, on that same journey or same path or supported you that, that made you feel less lonely? Yes. So this is actually more or less why we have this community right now. So more or less the people you find right now in the Shaolin Temple Europe, this is, this is the core. Yeah, this is the one that influenced me the most. These are the ones I have, um, 
I have some impact on. Let's say like this. Okay. And this constellation, it's good because like this temple, this community is the babies, all of our childs. Okay. In regards to the temple, but in regards to life, each one is also lonely. Mm. Yeah, I get that's it. You all buy it. I, this was the funny thing when you were speaking about it yesterday and I had this, this picture for a video or documentary. Um, we did, we didn't go with it, but there is, there, there's probably a highlight around it, but that almost like lone wolf mentality. And we've spoken about connection and having community and support. And, you know, with a Shaolin temple, you have that in a huge, huge way, but then I've all, I've always found comfort in, it is on me and my, everything for me, my internal experience is on me, whether I'm happy, whether I'm sad, whether I achieve success, whether I have good relationships. Like I always find the, a, co a level of comfort in going, it's on you and you are the one to blame if it goes wrong. You are the one to, to praise if it succeeds, whatever. But that has always been a huge thing to me. I mean, is that something that you, you, you have as well, some kind of mentality or is it all based in community? No, I mean, these are, of course, the thoughts that also like fill up my mind. Mm. But that's exactly it, yeah, this internal dialogue. Yeah. The more you want to develop, the more dialogue you will have to have. Yeah. This is, this is what it is. And, and even while being surrounded in a community, but at the end, when you're doing something, when you do your training, when you do your office work, it's still like you are alone and you observe yourself in which state you are actually. You know, so, so this more or less, uh, some people might get it as loneliness means it's something negative. No, it is what it is, lonely. Yeah. So, and if, if you think that I can't handle loneliness, uh, it's difficult to grow. Mm. Yeah, it's difficult to grow if you cannot handle loneliness. And that's really reassuring to hear because like I've had the stages of loneliness where I felt like this is on me, it's on my back, I, I'm going to do this and this is the path I want to go in. And then I've on the, on the flip side of that, I've realized that also, and this is the other message I want to put out there, is that there is huge, huge growth in connection and community as well. And it's like, you need to be able to do both. You, you, you need, you, that's for me personally. Like, I don't want to stick to being a one man band. I don't, I don't believe in self-made. I don't think that you can ever do it fully by yourself. I don't, I, I, I personally don't think people have had true, true success without at least standing on the giants before them who, who paved the path and most likely circumstance with the people who were around them at the time as well, who helped them get where, however it was. Um, I've always, but I've only just really had that over the last three, three or four years where I've started to really try and invest in other people and have them help me on my path, have them, um, you know, tell me when I'm wrong and, you know, try and take that on the chin and be part of a community and inspire each other. And I started to really speak about, you know, getting mentors and having basically what you do, like try and find masters and learn from them, whether it, and it could be anything. Like, I think some people go, well, I'm a filmmaker, so I have to have a mentor in filmmaking. But like, to me, a, a master could be, my, my mother, you know, she could be great at a certain thing and I, she could be the master for me in certain, in certain things. And I'll take those lessons that I find extremely valuable from her. It, and, you know, it could be li literally, it could be a relationship, someone who's got a great relationship and I could take their knowledge and wisdom on relationships and, you know, maybe discard the things I don't think are, are growthful for me in business. And I, I think there's that thing of like, learning from other people it could be books as well like you know the stories that i love autobiographies um they could be books i should ref refer them to read your book actually coming out in english soon hopefully yeah it's, it's going to happen but take some time what's the, what's the what's the book about is it all autobiographical or i actually had some conversation with your brother before 
I don't even know how to call it. So initially the idea was, like I said, many people have different ways of how they can get in contact with something. Some through the social media, some through a movie, some through like podcasts and other people through reading. So that there is a book was not like I wanted to have a book. It was just a logical consequence of having the possibility if somebody likes to read in order to get to all these topics that we are sharing through the channel, for example, then there's also like a book about it. So meaning everything in the last 36 years that I regard as, because of course the book is limited in that case, yeah, I had like 288 pages. So for 288 pages, this is what I have put in from the last 36 years, 36 years condensed into these pages. Yeah. Of course it's limited in knowledge but it still is enough. It's enough to, to get it. Okay. And this was like just the point about um, why, why I'm happy in a way that it also manifested, let's, let's, let's say like this. So I'm just, I just wanted to bring Luke on because it's actually his birthday tomorrow. And uh, in about two, three hours. Right? Two, three hours. Um, so yeah, Luke, I just thought I'd bring you on just to close out the episode. Mulligan Brother, um, episode one. So it'd be good to bring another brother on. And uh, yeah, I mean, third year coming to the Shaolin Temple. Yes. With Master Shang Yi. I mean, what's your experience been? Well, I've been twice. Twice, yeah, yeah, that's right. I didn't yeah. see you the first time. Yeah. Um, to be honest, it's just been, it's been a, an incredible experience. Um, I mean, I think the first time I was more, there was a lot of mystery. I was uh, like, yeah, just, uh, it was a bit curious. It was quite, um, I don't know what to say. Yeah, I just um, I wanted to find out a lot about you and the temple. And um, it's been a great journey, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I we've grown um, as... I think the temple's grown as well, which I think has been a wonderful experience. Yeah, yeah and I, the, the, one of the reasons I wanted to bring Luke on as well is because like, and, and you know, William's behind the camera as well, Neve's there, I mean, it's the whole family's here. Um, but we do want to say a massive thank you to you, you know. We, we do appreciate you trusting in our vision with the documentaries, with the interviews, um, maybe a project's going forward, you know, like we, we do appreciate that. And there's, some, there's something about it that's really worked and people have received really well. And it just, it, it feels natural. It feels really right. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah. I, I wanted to ask Luke to come on as well, just to, to say thank you to you. Yeah, it's been, it's been amazing. What I like the most about all of this, all these projects, is that everything we talk about when the right people with the right intention and the right time has come, the right people will meet. And all of this is all happening on screen right now. Mm. You see, this is the special part about this life. And the next time you come, mm -hmm. you're going to ride my Enfield. Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> don't, don't be injuring yourself. <laughs> right, we're going to close out the episode there. Uh, thank you so much for watching. The, all the social links to Shaolin.online are going to be down below. Uh, Mulliganbrothers.com are going to be down below. If you enjoyed the episode, I don't know what you do on Spotify and podcasts, but follow and do all that kind of stuff. And if you're on YouTube, subscribe, notification bell. Thank you. Thank you for watching and supporting us and uh, Master Shahang Yi and every single project that we've ever done has been so well received. So thank you so much. Have a blessed and productive day and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Thank you for watching the first podcast. I'm really curious. I want to know your guys' opinions. Throughout 2024, we're mixing things up. We're not doing less interviews. There's still going to be around 52 interviews throughout the year, maybe even more. But there will be another 52 podcasts to go alongside that. So if that sounds good, subscribe, hit the notification bell. But also, please, join in the community. Let me know what you think down below of the conversations with Master Shang Yi. 
Let me know what you think of my opinions. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me where I'm right. Tell me where you think you want to extrapolate. I'm going to be doing some of these episodes by myself soon. Um, next week, there'll be an episode where I'm just talking to you guys. So if that sounds like fun, it sounds like getting involved, please share the videos, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Um, as always, just a last mention, today's episode was powered by Huel. So if you want to find out more from Huel, head down below. And as always, thank you to everybody over the Christmas period who supported us at mulliganbrothers.com. The Inspire Change t-shirts, the journals, the posters are nearly all sold out. Now, if you want to get more, it's still buy one, get one free with the link in the description. But yeah, it was pretty crazy. I, I hope that you write your New Year's resolutions, your plans, you reaffirm your goals in the journals, whatever it is, you do the Momentum Mori posters and you use those tools. Don't let go of the tools after the first week, the two weeks, the three weeks of, of using them stick with them. You know, if, you, if you've taken on anything new at the start of the year, do yourself proud. Don't let yourself down and keep that promise that you made to yourself. The most important thing is to never break a promise to yourself. So if you're, jo if you're starting a journey, if you're joining the journey, if you're just continuing the journey, keep with it. Join us on Instagram if you need some more support. Drop me a message. I'll try and get it back to you. And yeah, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's going to be an amazing year. And if, if you're year is full of self-improvement, then I'm here to help. So if you need more information on that, um, follow us and join the journey. Thank you for watching. Have a blessed and productive day. And I'm excited for this year, guys. This is going to be a big one. I'll see you in the next one. Love you all. Peace.